This screencast is Wiring, JavaScript, and ROS. And like our previous screencast, notes are available in a paste bin in the description. Also, it's recommended you watch this video inside a YouTube player because we make use of annotations. So what we're going to be doing today is actually controlling a web page via ROS from an Arduino. And we're going to center the project around this sensor, uh, the Ping Ultrasonic Dis Distance Sensor from Parallax, uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's a pretty cool sensor, so you're likely to already want one for some other reason, so we're hopefully not asking you to go out and buy something you wouldn't otherwise. Uh, two, it's available pretty much everywhere, both uh, in America and Europe. Any adapter shack-like place, uh, Radio Shack in the U.S., uh, has them for a fairly reasonable price, and of course they can be had cheaper online. Uh, and third, uh, and perhaps most directly related to the screencast, it has a very simple uh, wiring requirement. So there won't be any complicated circuits with the Arduino, at least at this time. Um, so the unit has three pins. a ground pin, a 5 volt pin, and a signal pin. And what we're basically going to be doing on the Arduino is just basically wiring like to like, with the exception of the signal pin, which will wire to some arbitrary digital output input pin. Uh, I think in our case today it'll be 12, or let's just pick 12 because it's right underneath the lead. So, once you have that wired up, of course, that's only half the battle. You have to actually know how to talk to this unit. So let's take a look at that. So here we have a, a timing diagram for uh, talking to the unit, and it's a fairly simple protocol. Basically, the sensor just expects a high pulse for 5 microseconds as its cue to take a measurement. And the way it conveys that measurement back to you is, so the it's an ultrasonic sensor, of course, it's sonar. It emits high-frequency noise and then listens for that noise's echo. So what happens when you ask for a reading is it begins to hold the, the signal pin high, the same pin you sent it in, so this is a bidirectional pin. It holds that pin high when it's emitting the sound, and then it drops that pin low when it hears the echo of that sound. So in other words, that pulse width is the signal that it's sending out. So it's it's fairly straightforward. So with that understanding, let's go ahead and come up with a quick uh, wiring sketch. So I've pulled up the uh, wiring environment and we'll start out by just having your basic setup and loop handlers. Obviously, this is going to need some way to talk back to the main uh, machine and, and also ROS, so we'll, we'll uh, use a serial begin environment. Now, even at uh, 96 baud, 100 baud, this is going to be able to totally come up with a ridiculous number of samples for what we're going to be eventually doing to control a web page. Um, so let's go ahead and add a delay to this loop so that it will run at a more reasonable speed. Forty-two micros, uh, forty-two milliseconds rather, is roughly equivalent to twenty-four hertz. Uh, now of course the unit will actually run much slower than that because these measurements actually take time. They are, after all, based on measuring the speed of sound. So let's go ahead and assume that when we've entered this loop that our pin is low. So the thing we're going to need to do is go ahead and do that 5 microsecond uh, pulse of high to ask for a reading. So let's uh, do a pin mode on 12 and, and get that started.
So there we have the five microsecond uh, pulse of a pin high, uh, followed immediately by the pin low, and then we need to get ready to go ahead and read in the, uh, the incoming pulse width. Now, pulse in is a built-in Arduino uh, function that will measure pulse width, and it outputs an unsigned long, so that's what we'll go ahead and create a variable for, and it also needs to be told what kind of pulse to look for, so in this case, it's going to be a high pulse. And then once that's done, we'll just go back into the low state, which was our assumption when we began the loop. And that is pretty much reading from the sensor about every 24th of a second. Uh, and right now we're not doing any reporting back. So it's worth talking about, at this point if we were going to use raw serial, we begin refactoring this code to contact ROS. And we could do the equivalent with ROS bridge. We could, we could refactor this code so that it's a full ROS bridge client. So in other words, we could put the handshake in the setup and we could then send the JSON messages right from here. But the ROS bridge approach is uh, much more to push everything into the plumbing and try to have the applications be as ROS agnostic as possible. So instead of that, I'm just going to have this sketch report the microseconds back as characters right on the serial line. And we'll see what implications this has uh, in the next step. So let's go ahead and verify this code. Make sure it compiles. All right, so we're done. Let's go ahead and upload that to our Arduino board. Now, I'm using an Arduino Uno, which you can also get from Radio Shack. Uh, but any Arduino uh, should work with this particular sketch. and it's on the board and should be reporting back to us. So now that we have it uploaded to the Arduino board and running and communicating back to this machine, we need to get the data that it's outputting actually into ROS. So let's start off by making ourselves a little place to work. And then we'll start up a, a copy of ROS Core. Now, I like to run ROS Bridge at a slightly uh, lower sampling rate than is the default, just because I like it to use up as little CPU as possible. So let's go ahead and set its sampling rate to, say, 200, which, considering that the signal we're interested in is 24 hertz at the fastest, is more than enough. And with that done, we're uh, free to start a Ross bridge quietly in the background. Now I mentioned that if that we could have in our sketch implemented a full ROS bridge client. And had we done that, the advantage to that would have been that now we could, all we'd need to do is connect the serial port to the TCP IP port that ROS bridge is running on. And we could even use a simple utility we could put in a launch file like SOCAT for that. Um, it would look something like this.
Uh, and that would really be all there is to it, because the full Ross Bridge protocol is just ASCII, so the serial port's perfectly capable of it, and it's both ways. And there are advantages to that if you start to do more and more complicated things. When you start to subscribe to more than, say, two things, um, what we're about to do may become a little unfeasible, or at least not as elegant. Um, but what we're going to do instead of that, since we didn't do a full Ross Bridge uh, protocol implementation on the sketch, we're just going to use the same approach of using SOCAT, um, but put it through a filter so that the data coming off of the Arduino is in the appropriate Ross Bridge format. Uh, so we'll get started by starting off with the SOCAT command for that. So you can see that we're still, you know, of course, using the ignore EOF uh, option on the, the serial terminal, and we're talking to the, this is the serial terminal my Arduino happens to be on, and we're piping this through sed. Now the dash U is very important, because if sed is not run in unbuffered mode, it's not going to be a stream processor, and since it's in the middle of a pipeline, that's what we want, and if we don't do that, we'll get starts and stops in our input. Um, so now you might be asking, but wait a minute, there's a handshake in the Rossbridge protocol, how are we going to have that in just the said transform? Uh, well, a little trick we're going to use is we're just going to ignore the first measurement we get. We're going to transform that first measurement into the handshake, and then we're going to transform all the remaining measurements into the proper, proper JSON Ross Bridge uh, format. So let's go ahead and do that first measurement and convert it into the handshake. And if that syntax is uh, foreign to you, just take a look at our other screencast. So basically, this is just a request on from Ross for Ross Bridge for a raw socket. Now we need to actually transform each of the individual incoming uh, data packets, which is just going to be ASCII number characters. So that's easily done. Now we need to go ahead and pick a topic, so uh, why not uh, slash echo time? Now as far as the type is concerned, I mentioned that the pulse in returns an unsigned long. So th there's no unsigned things inside ROS, at least in the standard messages. So we're going to need to use a 64-bit integer to hold this. So that's going to be standard messages in 64. And that kind of data type just has a simple data field that contains the value. Now, we're going to pipe this into Netcat, obviously, eventually, but let's just go ahead and do a sanity check, because obviously this is sort of a complicated uh, regex. So we'll just hit Enter. And you see why the EOF ignore option is important. You see that stutter there? That was because the Arduino was coming online. And so if you don't have that ignore EOF, you're going to get a dropout from this technique. Looks like we're getting some reasonable data coming in. Looks like it's formatted correctly. So let's go ahead and pipe that into Ross Bridge via Netcat. And we can verify that that's working by looking at the Ross topic list.
and we see that echo time is indeed there. So let's see uh, if the frame rate or the, the sample rate is reasonable. And we're getting a solid 16 hertz, which is about what's expected because right now, of course, I'm not near the sensor, so it's going out the full three meters that the sensor can read, which in computational time is quite a lot of time uh, that that sound is traveling out and then never coming back. All right, so we have a working uh, Ross bridge. In other words, the Arduino is talking to Ross just fine. So now we just need to do the final part of the project, which is come up with a HTML page that uh, can make use of Ross.js to use this Ross information. So let's just open up a uh, simple HTML file. We'll go ahead and make this an HTML5 document. Obviously, we'll need to include the ross.js script uh, from the brown ross package repo uh, in our script tag. Now I'm including the experimental version because I like to live on the bleeding edge and also this gets updated more often. Obviously you can include a tagged version or a stack version or if you've downloaded Ross Bridge you can put it somewhere else. You don't have to live link, but there are advantages to live linking which is of course live bug fixes. Uh, now we need to add a script tag for ourselves and an on load to the message, uh, to the body uh, tags. I'm doing this this way because I don't want to get into using frameworks right now, but obviously you should use a framework with ROS.js because you should use a framework with JavaScript. Um, some common ones that have been used successfully with ROS.js include jQuery, Dojo. Um, if you're a big Brown fan, you can use Flapjacks. I've done that before. Uh, but here we're just going to use no framework so that we can show bare bones using ROS.js. So we have the handler for onload registered and ready. Uh, and the first thing it obviously needs to do is connect to Ross Bridge. Now here that's a local host connection to 9090. Um, because I don't even want to involve a web server, I'm just going to open this page directly. Uh, obviously, this could be a remote ROS bridge, as long as your routing was correct. Uh, you could pipe this through SSH, what what have you. Here it's local. Uh, there's no loss of generality for doing this remotely. Um, so we have our ROS connection. What we need to do is register a handler for when that connection is successful, which is used, which is done with set on open. And that handler is going to have two important jobs. It's going to register a handler for echo time. Remember, the data we're actually interested in. Uh, and then it's going to subscribe to that so that that handler actually gets used. So we'll start off with uh, just defining a quick handler on echo time.
and then we're going to actually subscribe to Echo Time, which is done through the ROSJS pseudo service that offers subscription. Of course, we're interested in echo time. We want to get all the messages possible, so we're going to use a minus one in the second argument. And just on the safe side, since we happen to know the type and it's a simple type this time, we'll include the type information so that this page can run even if the server's not currently up or if the Arduino board hasn't been plugged in yet and what have you. All right, so that's handled the subscription, and that means that this handler should be getting called the echo time handler. So now we need to actually decide uh, something we can do with this web page. Uh, now I've worked with the sensor before, so I just happen to know that for room temperature, uh, 300 microseconds is around an inch away from the device, and say 4,000 to 4,500 microseconds is about three feet away and that's a pretty good operating range so let's normalize that range into 0 to 255 so we can use it as a color um, and we'll just ignore things that are out of that range so we'll start off by getting into the actual data which remember that was a data field on the N64 message type And we'll do the, we'll basically ignore anything that's less than 300 or greater than 4,000. And now we'll need to normalize this into 0 to 255. So my math may be off here, but I think this would be an appropriate slope. And obviously we need to floor that so that we only get integers. So that should give us the range from a couple inches to three feet, normalized to be from 0 to 255. So now we just need to use that information um, to change some color on the page. And obviously the most prevalent thing we could change would be the, the background itself. So let's do that. So that will just be in grayscale uh, because it's RGB and it will basically override the contents of body so that it's only a style tag every time we get a message and that that will be the colorized version of the echo time. So that should be enough to get us started. Let's load that up into Chrome. All right, so I have my freshly deboxed sensor three wire connected to the Arduino just as we discussed. So if I open the web page we made, I now have a ROS enabled, web enabled, theremin, 
for people with synesthesia. I can take the background all the way to black and leave it there, or I can take it back up to white and leave it there, or I can leave it somewhere in between, or we can have a rave. Um, hopefully this will give you some ideas as to what you might can do with this kind of infrastructure. Um, obviously you can only go so far with the kind of command line transformations that I've presented here, but there's nothing stopping you from writing a processing sketch that works with the Arduino sketch to do more advanced ROS bridge, or just doing the ROS bridge in something like Python or C or whatever language you're comfortable in, because again, it's just raw sockets. So, this has been Wiring JavaScript in ROS, and please look at the notes for further help, and thank you very much.